AI stands for artificial intelligence. And I'll be honest, um, in the last few weeks, it seems like it's been dominating lots of headlines. Essentially, it's computer software that engages in human-like activities, and we're going to hopefully break it down for you so you can apply it in your work life. We all use it probably on a very regular basis, um, day to day and all the things that we do, but it should help in theory in HR, streamline processes, aggregate data, and we'll discuss with you the potential issues of ethics and how to use it responsibly within the context of your business life as opposed to your personal life. Um, we'll also talk about how we could utilize AI to simplify things in the HR world. Obviously, your day-to-day -day life is pretty complicated, um, lots of issues to contend with, and we will help you sort through how to use it to potentially analyze data, identify patterns and anomalies, maybe use it for decision-making purposes or provide advice regarding decision-making purposes, help you monitor performance, behavior, and engagement in ways typically we haven't been able to do. We can analyze emails, chats, and work patterns, really figure out if someone's really engaged or not engaged, potentially even help you figure out signs of burnout with an employee who's online way too often, doing too much work as opposed to not enough work, things we don't typically have the capacity to focus on because we don't have the data behind it. We just suspect it. It might also help us ferret out misconduct in the work. Um, those kinds of things that could hopefully simpl simplify the HR process and HR world um, and give you some tools to use to either correct behavior, reward behavior, those kinds of things. And with that, we will begin the program and I will turn it over to Natasha. Great. Thank you, Carrie. I was ready to roll, believe me. <laughs> Um, so as Gary mentioned, you know, we've heard a lot about AI. It's permeated pretty much any industry, any and every industry, and HR is no, you know, has not uh, gotten out of that. So a lot of recent developments in AI have helped HI, HR professionals move forward, right, with their day-to-day -day work. And that's, we're seeing that with a lot of, of industries. It's, it's helping with the root in work that is kind of mundane, um, but it's also extended beyond that within AI. And we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, things you should think about policies, how do you deal with different uh, service providers? Um, but for the purposes of what I'm gonna talk about, I'm just gonna talk about you know understanding AI in HR. Uh, so Carrie had talked about the definition of AI and typically you'll find that people use AI and machine learning interchangeably, whereas machine learning is, is more of, um, it's like a subset of AI, right? So it focuses on how the computer interprets data and learns and, and predicts. So in the context of AI, this can help with like cataloging employees' behaviors, as Carrie had said, right? If somebody's getting burnt out because they're online too long, that's where machine learning comes in. Another aspect of, of machine learning is called digital assistance, right? So that's more conversational. You're having a discussion with a bot. We've all talked to bots when we call the bank and, you know, somebody's like, how can I help you? And it's not a real person. But in HR, this can help with the onboarding process, right, to help with answering questions that maybe, you know, would take somebody to have to go dig up a catalog or a policy really quickly have at hand. Um, you know, so there are different ways that AI and subsets of AI can be applied to the HR system. And those are just a few examples to, to kind of move forward a bit more and kind of flush out some other examples of its use. Um, you know, we can talk about employee record management, as I said, right, that's something that's a very basic um, um, function of HR, but very important. And if you could put that with some type of AI system to make sure that you're managing and maintaining these records, that helps with uh, efficiencies, right, payroll processing benefits, um, you know, a lot of us have heard about the recruiting and the screening. Again, we're going to talk about bias and how that's a double sword, double edged sword, but it really does help speed up the process, right? It helps to get through the thousands of resumes or inquiries that you get as an HR professional in recruiting to actually kind of whittle down like which ones are relevant for the purposes of what we're trying to achieve. Um, and again, we'll talk about biases because that's a very key thing when we're dealing with AI. Um, you know, kind of garbage in, garbage out. So kind of understanding how you should be thinking about addressing those items. Um, the onboarding process, like I said, if there is a new employee, do they need to have specific CLE that will cover off some of their um, 
uh, gaps in knowledge, right? We can you can focus in on those things and make sure that you know onboarding is specialized and custom to the particular employee that you're hiring. Um, and we've seen it all, but ad, uh, you know, advertising for jobs, right? Postings and and monitoring those postings and bringing up job descriptions. That's something that you could also use AI technology to help with in the HR process. Next slide, please. So, you know, with every new technologies, there's, you know, benefits and challenges. So just to back up a little bit, there was a report done, um, Eightfold had, you know, surveyed about 250 HR leaders and they wanted to understand like, how are people using, you know, AI? Are they even using AI in the HR system? And it was surprising to see, I would say between 70 and 80% of HR professionals, and these are lead HR professionals in, in larger organizations, are using AI in some regard, whether it be record management, as I said, payroll processing, recruiting, performance management, and onboarding. So this is something that is really taken off and it's embedded in a lot of uh, systems and organizations. So, you know, it's not something that I think is just like a, a fly by the night. I think it will really continue to, to grow. And that's why we need to kind of get our arms around how do we deal with it? How do we manage it? How do we uh, guard against any type of downfalls? So with that, I can turn to kind of benefits and challenges. So as I mentioned with any new technology, right, there are pros and cons. Um, obviously, as I mentioned before, the benefits are streamlining, right? You can streamline different processes that don't need to have an individual uh, attending to it, which allows for the HR professionals to do what they're meant to do, right? It's engage with employees, figure out what next steps are, think about the big picture. If you can take those things off their plate, you can make the HR system and the HR departments more efficient, right? Uh, and more direct and um, uh, have a smoother process in terms of whatever they're trying to achieve in their organization. Reduction of costs. Again, you have less people doing root things, but you have more people doing the more high value things to move the the project, the projects, the understanding of how the company wants to grow um, and put that in the hands of, of the HR professionals. Uh, and enhanced decision making. So this is this is an interesting uh, concept, but it takes out the the guess work, right? Um, you can look at metrics. You can look at uh, if we are using this particular job um, website, is it working? Are we getting the right people in? Is the cost you know, in terms of you engaging this particular software, is it getting us the candidates we need? Do we need to pivot? So it gives kind of helps with some of those data analytic type um processes that can help you be more efficient and enhance your decision making to say, no, this is a lost cause. We're not making any benefits from this. Let's move on to something else. Um, challenges. Uh, everyone has heard of hallucinations, right? They've played with, if you played with chat, GP, chat GPT, you know, you would have seen, you know, everything looks probably like 90%, maybe even 80% great. And then you look a little further and you're kind of like, oh, okay, there's something terribly wrong here. Um, so, you know, there are biases, as I said before, garbage in, garbage out, right? And that's why a lot of the legislation and policies, especially from the federal level, looks at companies understanding what the inputs are into these algorithms, right? What are you putting in? Are you looking at what these are to make sure that they themselves are not biased, right? Do you have diverse teams that can identify where there's bias? Um, so it's a point that is not only unique to HR, it's unique, you know, it's kind of permeates all of the AI applications, uh, but it is something that companies and organizations need to be aware of. Um, you know, AI does not have human emotions, right? They can imitate human emotions, but they can't understand, right? So if you are interviewing a particular person or trying to assess whether somebody is a great candidate, and this also ties into the outliers, right? You know, whatever information you put into the algorithms, it's going to be um, pretty strictly adhered to. Uh, there are not or very limited ways in which you can try to say, okay, well, this person may not have, you know, nine to 10 skill set, but they have this unique experience, which would be great in our organization, right? So it's kind of like you can't rely specifically on AI because like, AI will be literal in terms of what inputs you put in and will have very little ability to be flexible to decide if maybe perhaps a particular candidate, and this is just in the context of recruiting, would be a great option for the, the organization. Um, another thing to think about, you know, HR departments deal with very highly sensitive information, right? You have social security number, banking information, you have all these things that, you know, 
if you are using a particular third party AI software, right, you have to understand what are their privacy, what are their cybersecurity um, policies, how are they ensuring that the information that you're running through these systems is actually accurate or is actually secure. Uh, and again, we're going to talk about how do you choose a vendor, right? What policies should you be putting in place further on in the presentation? Next slide, please. So these are just very high level applications in terms of you know, how a AI is being used in HR. So as I mentioned before, you know, recruitment and talent sourcing, right? Automating manual tasks such as job postings, advertising. Um, it can make things way more efficient for uh, the recruiters and making sure that you're getting the right candidates um, through you know, how many applications come into an HR recruiting department in a day. Um, it can analyze, filter candidates, uh, and allow the hiring manager to really hone in on those individuals who are probably the best candidates for the role. Onboarding, as I mentioned before, it, it helps to make the experience of people who are hired into an organization feel more customized and personalized, right? It's a good way to introduce uh, a new employee to, to the organization, um, to have somebody that's, or have a bot, however you want to call it, available to answer the questions as you're uh, starting in. And then, and again, as I said, it's it's also helps with the learning and development. I can have L, you know, learning and development that's specialized to me and my needs, as opposed to just general, you know, pick off this list of 50 different options in terms of, you know, how you figure out certain things or if you have a gap in your knowledge. It can customize it to make sure that it actually is, is based on what your needs are. And then another uh, way that's being used is to think about internal mobility, right? Who has, should be promoted? You know, who are the individuals that are uh, moving to a higher um, or working at a higher level than the level in which they're slotted, right? It allows for uh, upward mobility and it can help to make sure that you're maintaining again your workforce because you're suggesting or, or making sure that people are advancing when they're ready to advance. And I'll pass it along. Thanks, Natasha. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, now that Natasha sort of set the backdrop. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the policy and ethical considerations uh, and challenges that employers uh, face with respect to AI, <clears throat> both um, with respect to employee use of AI and then also um, the employer's use in its processes and procedures. Um, but I think it's important to sort of you know, read off what the headline is, which is, you know, based on these statistics, ready or not, AI is here and your employees are using it. Um, I think that's sort of the banner line that we need to sort of keep in mind as we're, you know, uh, talking about this presentation today, but also when you go back to your own uh, companies and, you know, start thinking about what you need to do. Um, but the important thing is, I think um, these survey results, so 43% of respondents in February, um, to one survey said that they use chat GPT at work. I actually think this is probably an old survey at this point, um, even though it's just a couple of months old. And I think that's because there's just been so much media attention on AI since February, um, which is actually when the EEOC put out its own uh, guidance, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about it later, its own guidance on employer use of AI and recruiting. So I wouldn't be surprised at that. Um, statistic is much higher uh, at this point, um, obviously depending on the industry, but in uh, the functions that employees are performing. But I do think it's important to sort of point that out. Um, and then 70% of people who said they use AI don't even know um, that their managers, or their managers don't even know that they're using it, um, which is you know another critical piece to sort of understanding what the policy considerations are for employers' uh, use of AI. The fact that you you may or may not know whether employees are using a, a uh, AI in their tasks um, shouldn't stop you from thinking about it. Um, and even employers who prohibit the use of chatbots or AI or have some sort of prohibition in some job categories or for some tasks um, should be aware that employees are probably using it in one form or fashion. Um, you know, the other sort of note here is that employers are are keen to develop or to hire people um, who are experienced in not just chat GPT. I mean, this particular survey addressed chat GPT, but um, but AI generally, um, and that's because it helps build branding and it can help generate um, and amplify existing marketing and copy. Um, and so, you know, understanding where sort of your workforce lies with respect to its use of AI is really important. 
Um, one sort of anecdotally, I suppose, um, one one point here is I may or may not fall into the category of the managers knowing that I uh, use AI for some functions. Um, Carrie is our new labor employment practice group chair. Um, and I didn't tell her before today's presentation that I actually used AI to help me generate an outline for my slides. So Carrie, I'm disclosing that to you now. We'll, um, we'll talk about this later, John. <laughs> thanks, Carrie. Um, but in, in all seriousness, um, using AI has a lot of utility in a lot of job functions. Um, it can help collect vast sources of information and distill them in a fraction of the time that it would take a human to do that. It can help organize thoughts as it did for me today for, for my outline and set out even some good points that I wouldn't even think about in, in preparing for today's presentation because someone else somewhere in the world has thought about it and AI can pick that up. So there's quite a bit of utility in, in AI, not just in sort of the way we produce output, but also as, as Natasha talked about a second ago in HR processes. Um, but it also comes with some risks. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about how you all as employers should prepare for employee use uh, of AI. So we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Um, first and foremost, I'm going to talk about sort of policy considerations in connection with your employee's use of AI. Um, and I think the way to think about this is, um, is, is in developing policies or coming up with um, sort of a game plan is what gives your company its value. And I think first and foremost is confidentiality of sort of the secret sauce, right? So protecting um, companies' confidential information from disclosure. Um, employees, whether purposefully or accidentally, um, thinking about their use of AI should be front and center of your, your minds as employers. Um, basic confidentiality policies that you probably already have in place and confidentiality agreements that you have with your employees um, generally cover the basic obligations that employees uh, have to maintain uh, a company's confidential information. Um, but employees aren't necessarily connecting the dots between those policies and the agreements they may have and their use of AI to perform certain tasks. And I say this because any input into an AI system that isn't specifically captive to your company, meaning chat GPT or something like it, that's an open source software, um, can release information out into the ether once an employee starts using it. So if you're not familiar with ChatGPT, um, again, I, I only am because I use it to prepare outlines for presentations, um, but it's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. If Essentially what you do is you insert a prompt into the ChatGPT system, um, and you should try it if you haven't already, not necessarily in connection with your work, but just so you are familiar with how this thing works. Um, and when you do that, the, the chat GPT feature automatically puts that information out into the universe and um, it pro the prompt basically if it contains confidential information, if an employee you know asks a question that contains confidential information or says I need to prepare X, Y and Z and it contains some sort of proprietary company information. The system not not only uses that to respond to the prompt that the employee puts in, um, but it learns from it. Uh, it learns from that input and it can use it in response to other prompts from other people who are outside your organization in the future. So ensuring your confidentiality policies and the training that goes along with those is appropriately tailored to this new technology is going to be key in protecting the company's um, value uh, and assets. Um, another thing to consider is accuracy. You know, companies are, if they're putting out false or misleading information that impacts their reputation. And so, as I noted a minute ago, you know, I use ChatGPT to create the an outline for today's slides, but my lawyer brain, of course, tells me I need to question basically everything that comes across my desk, right? Trust, but verify uh, and verify closely. Um, and I bring this up because, um, you know, the lawyers on the call are probably aware of a recent litigation where a lawyer submitted a brief to a court where he used ChatGPT to generate uh, a brief. Um, and the brief, uh, unfortunately, contained sites to cases um, that didn't exist. And when the court examined those cases, um, it determined that the propositions that he stated in his brief were not supported by case law. Um, and the court ended up sanctioning the lawyer uh, for not having spent the time to verify the brief that he submitted to the court. 
um, it's a bit of an extreme example, but it's it's one um, that basically I think illustrates the fact that employees should be made aware uh, and regularly trained and reminded that the information that that um, something like a chat GPT puts out should be verified, uh, particularly if they're using that information to put, you know, um, to put uh, advertising or marketing out into into the public arena. Um, because if it turns out it's not true, that can have an impact on the company's um, uh, reputation. So having clear policies that govern <clears throat> uh, accuracy of work product is another necessary uh, piece to all this to ensure your employees know their obligations. And also, if there's consequences, what those consequences are for failure to comply uh, with whatever policies you're putting out. Um, another thing to think about is fairness, right? So policies governing employee use of AI should be clear, they should be thoughtful, and um, also reserve flexibility for the company um, to make employment-related decisions based on the particular circumstances. So if you're permitting some employees to use AI, but not necessarily others, consider whether doing so may impact um, others' performance or their ability to actually achieve their job. And think about whether that's fair in the context of whatever the job is. Um, also, if employees are using AI and you don't know they're using AI, consider that in your evaluation um, processes and procedures so that you're uh, you're not is essentially disadvantaging some employees who maybe um, aren't skilled or don't know they can use certain AI functions in, in performance of their jobs. And then, of course, making sure that managers and HR generally are trained with respect to um, any HR applications um, so that uh, the application of those systems is fair across the board. Um, another note just to, you know, we sort of bat this around internally, but this is, you know, even though AI is a new sort of phenomenon and newish technology in relation to the way that employees may do their job um, is what's old is new again. And, you know, employees use of AI uh, has interplay with other company policies, you know, making sure that employees know that they should be tracking their time um, accurately. You know, if they're using AI functions and essentially taking off the rest of the day because it has improved their efficiencies, um, making sure employees aren't, you know, stealing time from the employer uh, by adequately, you know, by ineffectively uh, recording their time or vice versa. If they're using AI functions or if they sort of are, are using, you know, devices that the company provides um, off the clock, make sure that employees are, are actually recording their time appropriately so you can you can pay them uh, adequately. You know, anti-discrimination, non, uh, non-harassment policies continue to apply um, regardless of whatever technology employees are using. Um, an important thing to note is that um, ADA reasonable accommodations um, are important to consider in connection with employees' use of AI, whether you're sanctioning that use or not. You know, depending on what the employee's essential job functions are, make sure that the tools you're providing them to do their work, um, allow them to do so, and open up an avenue for employees to, disabled employees to, um, you know, request reasonable accommodations um, if they need to in order to use the tools that you're providing them. Um, we can go to the next slide if you'd like. Um, <clears throat> so that, Last slide was all sort of the considerations, I think, um, that are at a high level, at least, um, what employers should be thinking about with their employees' use of AI. Um, but of course, you know, HR and management will start using H uh, AI, as, as Natasha talk, touched on earlier, um, in performing certain functions. Um, and there are some new uh, and emerging guidelines and rules on, uh, and some old, uh, actually, um, that will govern um, sort of how employers should be using uh, and looking at the use of AI in HR functionality. Um, and the first, I, I think, and this is the one that's most most recent, I suppose, um, is the EEOC guidance from February um, that focuses on employers' fair and unbiased use of AI in, in HR systems and processes. Um, and really what it asks is whether recruiting tools are fairly evaluating candidates regardless of their protected uh, categories. Um, it basically encourages employers <clears throat> um, to ensure that they are focused on um, rooting out biases that may exist in certain AI, AI recruiting and evaluation processes and procedures. Um, it encourages employers to regularly audit the systems they're using to identify um, any biases and root them out and address them if they exist. 
Um, and it also f- has a particular focus on individuals with disabilities um, and their ability to get past a screening st- stage. Um, and, and, you know, encouraging employers to uh, ensure that applicants understand that there are reasonable accommodations that those applicants are entitled to if they need it because of a disability. Um, a lot of those initial screening uh, interviews that utilize AI um, should be closely examined to make sure that you're, you're focused on uh, what you need to do to avoid liability. The other thing uh, that I think is important to point out, and we're, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this today, but if you're using vendors for this type of um, you know, performance evaluation system, or if you're using um, software, so if you're purchasing software from a third party provider, make sure you're reviewing the contracts that you have with those providers, uh, with your legal counsel. Um, you know, the indemnity provisions in those uh, contracts are going to be incredibly important. If their system fails, if they basically have a system that creates a, a bias that ends up creating liability for you as an employer, um, you should be sure that you can, um, you know, uh, that, that your indemnity provision is fair and reasonable in connection with that system. Now, if you're not obviously auditing it or, um, you know, using it the way it should be used, that's 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 one issue. But if the system itself has a flaw, um, you want to be sure that you're adequately protected from potential discrimination lawsuits. Um, the other part that I think is important to evaluate is and to press your vendors on is how often they are conducting their own audits. Um, and and get the information about those audits from those vendors. Make sure that you can have access to that so you understand what exactly is happening, what exactly they're seeing on their end, um, so you can make adequate decisions about um, the systems you're using. Um, I do want to talk quickly about um, some, this is the sort of older guidance, I would say, on OFCCP's Uniform Guidelines and Employee Selection Procedures. Um, these these uh, rules sort of came about years and years ago, um, and they were they were promulgated after employers started using aptitude tests or pre-employment tests for employees, the old paper and pencil um, <clears throat> days of, of employment tests. Um, but what the guidelines essentially say is, first of all, they regulate, the o- OFCCP regulates um, federal contractors. Um, uh, OFCCP in connection with the Department of Labor and the EEOC actually put out these guidelines. But essentially what it says is that statistical disparities among protected classes based on certain test results um, may be evidence of adverse impact. And even though a test may be facially neutral, if it has a disparate impact on certain protected groups of people, um, they fail the test at a higher rate than the non-protected people. Um, that can be evidence of discrimination. Um, employers can avoid liability if they just if they demonstrate that a particular test, um, has a business necessity, um, but to do so, they have to basically prove that um, the test itself is a valid predictor of job performance. So this relates back to HR systems in recruitment generally. If you're using uh, AI uh, technology in your recruitment, in your candidate screening processes, you should be sure that whatever criteria that system is using is a valid predictor of job performance so that you can avoid or at least limit the risk of a potential disparate impact class action lawsuit um, under you know, Title VII, which continues to apply to all aspects of employment. Um, important things to think about, important to understand, um, you should review the uniform guidelines and employee selection procedures um, to be sure you understand them and that you're applying those standards to whatever recruiting software you're using. Um, I'll talk a minute in a minute about state and local law considerations, um, but it is just knowing that these laws are coming online. There are states that are developing laws specifically impacting employer use of AI, but they all relate back to the same basic principles of, um, uh, you know, under Title VII, under the ADA, and under the ADA, EA, and other uh, state equivalents uh, for employment-related statutes. Um, we can go on to the next slide. So uh, I mentioned a couple state laws. These there's there's several um, that are coming online, but these are two that have sort of been in the news lately. New York City, in particular, um, its new regulations uh, come online July 1st. So there's a couple more days uh, to come into compliance. But um, what that law, what that ordinance basically says, is that uh, an employer's use of AI in hiring or promotional decisions. Um, 
<clears throat> will require some level of uh, compliance. So essentially what employers are required to do under this new law is notify applicants and employees that, that the employer is using AI um, and provide some level of detail about what that AI system is and what's gonna be used. Um, you're required to disclose the details about what data is being collected in connection with um, your use of AI and HR processes. Um, and uh, you have to disclose um, uh, that process to applicants and employees. Um, and you also have to have an auditing system in place to evaluate for possible biases um, that may negatively impact uh, minority groups in favor of non-minority groups. Um, pretty simple to comply, but you wanna be sure you're doing so because the, um, the penalties are, are potentially significant. Um, we'll see how this new law sort of gets rolled out. Um, there's been criticisms from both employer groups um, and employee advocate groups, um, which generally means uh, if they if both sides don't like it, it's probably a fair law. Uh, so we'll see how it gets rolled out, but it's something to pay attention to if you've got employees in New York City. Um, Illinois has actually had a law in the books for three or four years now called the Artificial Intelligence uh, Video Interview Act. Um, it's similar to New York in the sense that you've got to uh, provide notice of use um, if you are using video AI software um, in your in your employee screening. Uh, employees actually also have to, or I'm sorry, applicants also have to consent to its use uh, before you use it. Um, so be sure that you you are obtaining that consent in some form or fashion uh, from applicants before uh, uh, implementing an, an AI video um, system. Um, and then, of course, you have to notify applicants of any particular data that you're collecting and maintaining, and then um, your data destruction policies and procedures uh, have to be disclosed as well. One amendment to the law that uh, recently came online <clears throat> um, requires employers that are using AI video software um, to select candidates for in-person interviews. You've actually got to collect uh, demographic data uh, and report it to the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. Um, there's an annual reporting obligation that uh, re requires demographic demographic information uh, related to candidate selections, candidates who are selected and rejected uh, by the AI system. Um, so that is something that is new that uh, employers will have to start complying with uh, as of December 31st this year. Um, we can go on to the next slide. <clears throat> Um, I do want to briefly touch on ethical considerations. We'll we'll talk a little bit in a little bit more detail on this later. Um, but there are there are things to think about um, in connection with an employer's use of AI in either HR systems or any other sort of aspect of of the company's day-to-day um, -day operations. Um, and I think the most critical thing to focus on is employee trust. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of information and some disinformation out there um, about AI right now. And so helping employees understand exactly what you're doing, exactly what you're using and how you're using it is is key. And so being transparent in your AI processes and decision making procedures and helping employees understand what you're using and how you're using it um, is going to be key to not just buy in, but to reducing the risk of a, a potential morale problem. Um, and then I think you might want to consider providing recourse for employees who are impacted by AI informed decisions. You know, let them ask questions, give them sort of an understanding of <clears throat> what was um, what was evaluated, how the system evaluated it, even if it's just the ability for an employee to review the system's inputs, the evaluation criteria and the outputs, and you don't change your ultimate um, you know, employment related decision that may help sort of um, at least clear up any questions that they're, you know, that the systems are fair um, and that they're using, that you're using them appropriately. Um, and then I'd make sure that employees have access, <clears throat> obviously, to the policies you're putting in place, those policies we talked about um, a bit ago, um, so that they know how you're using your system. Um, and then I, I actually think it's important to be very honest with employees about the potential for job displacement. Um, if you see that as a reality, as something that, that's possible down the line, um, be honest about it. Talk to your employees. You don't have to tell them all the nitty gritty, but at least think about how you're gonna communicate that to employees. Um, and then whether or not you're gonna offer some sort of training, right? So there may be job displacement for the way the workforce looks today, but that doesn't mean that current employees are out of a job. 
if you're going to offer training on, on new systems, um, I think that's a long way to reassuring employees that what you're doing is going to actually help them improve um, on on what they're doing now. Um, and I would communicate these this information well in advance of implementing anything. Um, employees hate surprises. Um, that's sort of where we get caught up in in a lot of our uh, uh, defending employers um, is is when there's a surprise. You know, we always talk about perform basic performance man performance management. Um, employees should know going into a, a, a performance review cycle what you're going to tell them uh, in advance, and if they don't. <clears throat> then there's a real risk that they will see what you're telling them as potentially discriminatory. The same is true with, you know, implementation of new AI systems. You want to be clear, tell employees in advance what you're going to do. And then I think it's also crucial to talk about some of the positives of, a of AI. It can enhance an employee's productivity. It can give them new skills and open up new opportunities. These are things that I think are really critical to ensuring that you don't have a morale problem. Um, also consider whether that's true. You know, sometimes it doesn't necessarily have a, a positive impact on employees, but if it does, don't be shy about talking about it. Um, and of course, one thing I, I asked the question here, sort of hypothetical or, you know, the proverbial question, should AI replace human judgment? Um, absolutely not in HR processes. Um, you know, be sure, as Natasha said, you know what's going in and coming out of your systems, perform those audits, understand what's going on, and then whatever information the AI systems is kicking out, be sure somebody's looking at it to evaluate it and understand sort of what is coming out of, of those uh, processes. Um, nothing can really replace the human judgment, human emotion and responses. Um, and so being sure that you understand sort of how your systems are working is going to be key. Um, and, you know, again, make sure that you're auditing your systems and that HR and your management teams are appropriately trained um, on how to use it uh, uh, on a going forward basis. We can go to the next slide. Um, this is just a short list that sort of as a recap of policy and ethical considerations of uh, employer to do's. Um, so, so take note of this. I think these are sort of the high level things. There's probably more um, that, that we could talk about. Um, and any one of these sort of generalized subjects could possibly be a webinar of their own. Um, but these are sort of some things that I thought employers should be thinking about doing in preparing for um, both their use as employers of AI and employees use of AI, whether or not you've sanctioned it. Um, again, I think there is there, there are employers out there that have prohibited use of machine learning or AI and in, in, uh, for their employees. Um, that's fine, but be sure that employees know that and the consequences for violating those rules. Um, if you've got flexibility, make sure that employees know about it. Um, try to, your best to understand what employees are doing in terms of their use of AI, especially if it's something like a, a um, you know an open source software like ChatGPT. Um, and, and keep that dialogue open so that uh, you have a full understanding of what's going out, what's being put in, um, and how your employees are using it. And um, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, Michael, I think this is you. Yeah, so this is where we sort of talked about discussing all together because uh, the, the whole idea is, at least if you're like me, before getting deep into the weeds of what AI is, I was even trying to figure out what types of tools are consistent with what we call AI-based recruiting. What, what are we talking about? What tools do they look like? And so you see chatbots, you see go to a website, the bottom of the page, hey, can I answer any questions for you? That's an AI tool that people put on their websites. You've got your virtual assistants, different software for resume screening, applicant tracking systems. We have many clients that actually develop those tools for use with other individuals or other companies. And then automated onboarding software. If you say, hey, go click on all of this, it's going to go through your paperwork and all that. Those tools, those software, the electronic systems that you have in place, that's all the AI recruiting tools that you can use. And the question that comes back for you as the, the, you know, the legal team, the human resource managers is, you know, what am I doing all of this for? How is this going to make my company more efficient? How is it going to uh, help my you know, workforce get the job done better or faster or with more, you know, lack of burnout, as John was mentioning earlier. Um, and, and we talked through a little bit of, um, so far on this uh, webinar, but what we're talking about is 
there's a lot of tasks in the job that someone is highly skilled to have the job that they have, but they all often have these sort of low skill but high volume tasks that have to be done. We've all dealt with those in the lawyering world. We talk about non-billable tasks that just have to get done. But the idea is, how can I make that more efficient? And that's what AI-based recruitment tools are designed to do, is to make things more efficient or to address concerns before you even recognize that they're a concern that needs to be addressed. Um, and so, I mean, John, let me know if you, if you agree with this, but so the issue I see with not using AI tools uh, is, is we find ourselves over time, we found, okay, one manager's really good at hiring good candidates and then another manager's not. And it comes down to how that manager goes about the process, how they screen candidates, and they're sort of in their silo. But if you take that away, if you say, okay, we're going to use a tool that's going to help us identify of these 100 resumes, the top 10 or five to do interviews, you avoid, I call it idiosyncratic grading, but just this siloed or compartmentalized individual making biased decisions that they don't even know. They're implicit biases. Oh, I won't hire from that school. They're not you know, good enough. Or I'm going to hire someone who on their resume, it looks like they're going to work overtime time or whatever it may be that it tends to favor persons without kids, persons in a, an ethnic majority or minority, male versus female. Uh, and so what I've seen AI do in a, a very beneficial way is not only efficiently weed out candidates that may not be the right fit, but also weed out in a very consistent way across an organization. Once you have a tool in place that can help you put the inputs in and get the outputs that it, it gives you. I've seen a consistency or the ability to have consistency that's very, very beneficial to employers. Yeah, and I would just throw in, Michael, if I could interrupt for one second. Please. Um, two thoughts on that. Number one, <clears throat> this is what I was talking about a second ago in terms of um, – you know, broadcasting what's positive about AI. You know, I think there's a lot, and it wouldn't doesn't need to necessarily be you know company wide, but it can be part of your training protocols for managers who are engaged in performance evaluation and candidate selection. Um, you know, making sure they're understanding the benefits of it, um, and then using it to train those sort of maybe not great evaluators um, in help in sort of understanding where their weaknesses are so that they can actually make better decisions on a going forward basis. So there there are positives here that are really critical to think about in how you might use it, use AI systems, um, you know, all these tools that, that Michael just talked about um, in connection with um, uh, recruiting, um, performance evaluation, um, uh, you know, compensation decisions, all that, will uh, these these tools are helpful. Um, and so I think, again, just relaying the positives to your management team at the very least, um, if you're using this, um, will be helpful. The other thing, I'll, I'll just be a little contrarian, but ensuring that whatever inputs you're putting in, because if you're saying that we want the same workforce that's been in place since the beginning of time, you may not, you may be weeding out maybe diverse candidates, right? So oh, for um, sure. There are positives, but you have to just make sure that you're understanding, like, what are we putting into these algorithmic systems, right, to, to understand what the outputs would be. And I'm not saying that, you know, the AI in of itself is biased. Again, as I said before, it's the input. So if you're saying, give me a workforce that we've had in place, our management, it may inadvertently weed out people who may be diverse candidates. Probably. Right. And that that is that's the big risk. And that's why all of these, you know, laws and sort of the guidelines coming online from the EEOC and the various states specifically require employers to audit their systems. Because if, you know, if I if I have a bias towards um, white cisgendered men um, and it and I that's the input I put in the system, the system's going to think that's what I want. And it's going to you know potentially kick that back out at us. Um, when we're evaluating candidates or, or performance. Um, and so <clears throat> to Natasha's point, that's exactly right. This is really nerdy, but I actually have a, um, a quote from Stephen Hawking that I think sort of sums that part of it up <laughs> <laughs> precisely. Something he said in 2014, which is, um, success in creating artificial intelligence would be the biggest event in human history. Unfortunately, it might also be the last unless we know how to avoid the risks. Um, mm -hmm. That's a bit of a sort of doomsday statement. But for an employer, especially, you know, small employers where this could be bet the company kind of stuff, um, you know, there's real value in it uh, as long as you know how to avoid the risks. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next slide, please. 
So there's the recruitment side of the AI-based tools. There's also the performance management. And Natasha kind of walked through several of the different ways where you can, you know, go through the different tools to help you identify burnout before it happens, uh, to, you know, figure out where you have processes that can be streamlined or improved. You can set goals, you can put in KPIs, and you can have an mm -hmm. AI tool that tracks that, that allows you to efficiently monitor that things are being met in real time, provide customizable reports or or, you know, detect trends that you wouldn't maybe have noticed, but a computer algorithm that's analyzing the data and parsing through it can detect and can analyze um, in real time and also constantly. So it's not just today, it's tomorrow and next week. As new data is input, you get fresh data and fresh insights as to, okay, they were doing great, but now their their hours have gone way up. Is it the end of the month and it's in accounting? Okay, this is an issue that we have cyclically we need to address. And maybe you're aware of some of those more, you know, open examples like accounting in the end of the month billing cycle, but maybe you're not aware of individuals in HR who have more of a season, you know, a seasonal hiring process that you haven't tracked how that affects them in terms of hours, right? I mean, many on this call probably deal with that in terms of your business's seasonality or the different ebbs and flows and whether or not your employer is currently tracking that is something that maybe an AI-based tool can help you, you figure out. And then something I find very interesting is it's not only, you know, the now, it's not the data about what's happening now. It's also that you can predict future performance based on these tools because when you have all the data and over enough time, a big baseball fan, we use all of these types of tools in the baseball world, the sabermetrics and all the other, to try and predict how someone's going to do not just now, but two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. And as Natasha mentioned, you know, there's the chance that biases will be input into this process. You have to be very guarded against it. But the wealth of data that the AI tools and AI metrics systems that are available allow employers to make more data-driven judgments on that versus maybe a systemic practice in your company where the person who seemed to be the highest performer, which is not data-driven, but was more personality-driven or relationship-driven, AI tools can allow you to predict performance based on, you know, objective data metrics. And so there's a way to use that as one input. There should still be a human judgment at the end, but an input that allows you to get to that goal. Um, next slide. Here we go. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm here just to do a quick interjection for anyone that is seeking CLE credit today. The CLE uh, attorney affirmation form is in the chat. It was put in right at the beginning. So if you are seeking CLE credit, um, please take note of the CLE code. I will read it twice. Unfortunately, we cannot send it. We cannot put it in the chat anywhere. So just please let me know if you need me to say it more than that. So the code today is LL9JU. That's Lima Lima nine Juliet uniform. Again, that's LL nine J U. Thanks so much. Thanks Liz. All right, next slide. Perfect. Okay. And this is a summation of exactly what Natasha and John and I have been talking about in terms of potential risks in AI algorithms. The, the key here is that the EEOC is not vetting you on what you've done in isolation from what your vendors are doing. They are saying if your vendor is the one that you outsource the screening tool to, they develop the tool, it's their responsibility. No, it might be your responsibility to make sure the tool is appropriate, that the inputs that they're using are non-biased. And ultimately, an algorithm is only as good as the person who creates it, right? If I write an algorithm that says exclude anyone over 40, that algorithm's only going to produce a biased result. And maybe that's the result, and I'm not insulated from that based on the fact that uh, someone else did it, a vendor did it. And that's where, you know, John was talking earlier about your indemnity clause in the contract. You want to be very careful of that because several of these AI vendors want to disclaim, hey, I put this tool together. It's trade secret, so you can't see anything about how I put it together. Oh, and if there's any adverse impact, it's on you. Um, so you want to be very careful about how you go through all of that. Uh, Another thing is the the lack of judgment or empathy that a computer can give, right? We we talk a lot about 
okay, this is data-driven metrics. And data can only tell you a certain portion of the story. And it can be a lot. It can be very uh, objective and helpful. But at the end of the day, if it's not tracking like when someone shows up or when they work late on weekends, if that's not the tool you're using, but that's something that's very necessary to your business. Or when someone was you know out sick and another employee filled in, and that was something you needed in that time that was a, a high level um, you know, strategic business time for you, that's maybe not going to be captured by the AI or developing the tool the right way, maybe it will be. But you have to look at that and say, okay, once we get the data-driven outputs, what are we doing with it? Who's analyzing it both for what went into it and then what we do with what we get out of it, right? Because there's input biases and there's export biases. Uh, Natasha said garbage in, garbage out. But you know, you can take garbage in and fix it up to where it's not garbage. And then if you don't fix the what comes out and make sure that what you're using it for is a proper purpose, then you're still kind of you know systemically having the biases and, and problems you had. You just inserted AI to kind of streamline the first half of it. Um, and don't discount the psychological impact of Big Brother. Once you start telling employees that they're being monitored, everything's being tracked, a tool is doing all of this, you want to be very careful because that can have a very profound impact on psychology of employees. How do they feel like they're able to, you know, get through it. Oh gosh, the computer's going to know if I logged off for five minutes. We see this with people tracking, like if you have like those online chat tools and, oh, it says you're away and managers that are monitoring it too, too um, strongly and the employees feel completely suffocated. That could lead to burnout, could lead to high attrition rates. And so you want to be very careful that even though the AI tool can be very good for your business, there are so many other impacts on a personal level and a legal level that you want to be very careful uh, about, you know, counting and accounting for. Next slide, please. Yeah, oh, sorry, just, <clears throat> yeah, say one quick thing on that. Please. <clears throat> sorry for uh, jumping in here. But um, but that sort of goes back to what I was talking about, you know, earlier with with employee transparency. Um, Liz, if you could go back to the prior slide real quick. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, the the, um, the the empathy part of this is actually really important and sort of understanding how to how to use the system appropriately. Um, employees are highly skeptical of of employer monitoring. Yes. Um, incredibly skeptical. And there are some state laws that are coming online that, that address that, or may already be online, um, that address uh, employer monitoring. Um, one of the things we really encourage employers to do is in their general employee handbook is to have a disclaimer that nothing they do using uh, company systems um, is, is uh, private, right? So they have no right or expectation of privacy. Putting employees on notice of that, reminding them of it is important because, again, if you just sort of spring this stuff on employees um, and they don't think about it or they don't remember that there's a statement like that in the employee handbook, um, they're going to be highly skeptical of what you're doing and they're going to criticize um, those actions you take. And so just thinking through sort of that approach and how to appropriately sort of message things to employees is going to go a long way to reducing that skepticism um, and potentially, you know, a claim down the road. Absolutely. Okay, next slide. And we've covered a lot of what the last couple of slides are going to go over. So I'm going to go fairly quickly through them. I don't want to shortchange you, but you will see sort of some thematic overlaps with what both Natasha and John mentioned. So one of the things was, what are all these AI tools? What kind of options do I have? And the thing you need to be thinking about is, what tools do I need? Am I suffering from high turnover or my HR employees are stretched too thin or we lack the data to make objective decisions? And so we're overly reliant on managers. Oh, I feel like this person is X, Y, Z. There are different tools that address each level of that. And you can start seeking out vendors who sell these tools. What is this tool for? How does it help me? How much does it cost? And there are real costs that go into all of these tools, obviously, right? Everything that seems to be beneficial can come at a cost. And for some employees and employers, certain tools are extremely beneficial. And for others, it may not be beneficial to your business because you've got people who are already handling that or internal tools you're already using. So think through the timeline it'll take to implement it, how hard it will be to train people on, how skeptical your employees will be of it and collaborate with those people who are going to be entrusted to use it, right? If they don't know how it works, uh, if they don't want it, if if, if they're don't, not able to see how it's going to benefit them, as John said, they're skeptical, they, they need some help to understand why this is going to be a benefit, why it's not going to put them out of a job. Um, next slide. 
So, and this is, we've talked a lot about picking your vendors and a couple of things that I wanted to, to focus on is also think about vendors in the sense of what support are you going to have on an ongoing basis? If they're very closed at the opening, when they're trying to sell you on their tool, if they're not very forthcoming with what data that they're using to do the input. So they want you to be the indemnifier of everything that they do right, wrong, or indifferent. That's a, a big red flag at the beginning of a relationship versus say an AI tool generator, someone who makes one that says, okay, here's the inputs. We work with you throughout the process. These are scalable. These are updatable. These are changeable. All of that uh, is something that should factor into which tools you're looking for. And when you're vetting your vendor, think about the obligations you have as an employer. Pretend you're making this tool in-house. What kinds of things is the vendor maybe not thinking about that we have to? So John mentioned that, like, you know, Title VII applies to your AI tools. The ADA applies to your AI tools. What about, okay, your website is ADA compliant, right? For persons with needs for accommodation to access your website. Is the AI tool for the online application and, and onboarding process, is that ADA website accessible? You may have thought about that for your website, but perhaps the AI vendor didn't make their tool accessible. And that could be on you for not providing a candidate with a disability with an accessible tool to use. So be very thoughtful about, pretend it's your own tool that you're doing it in-house and you have all the liability, what would you want to know and how would you want to improve it? Next slide, which I believe is the last one. No, I was just going to say one no, thing on that Go point Go ahead, Natasha. as well. Sorry. Uh, just wanted to say also when you're dealing with uh, companies in this area, there have been a lot of startups that have just spun up uh, because AI is so popular and exciting. So just do some diligence on the company in and of itself. Will it be around for the long haul, right? right. Um, is it just something that's fly by night? Do they understand what they're doing? So that's something I think you also should be considering uh, when dealing with an external vendor. Agreed. Okay. So this is the last slide, uh, the next mm -hmm. one. And it's my favorite as a former teacher, educate, 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 right? Educate the, the people who are going to be using the tool, educate the people who are making the tool on what you want. Um, this is not a baby boomer versus millennial issue. I am fit into the millennial category and I didn't know what AI was before a couple of months ago, but it's been in the news so much I can't miss it now. But th this isn't an issue of that. These are new tools. They're a different way of, of working. And so it's about how do I use it? How do I train on it? This is like Microsoft Excel, which has been around forever. How many people know how to do a pivot table, right? This is not a, a, a baby boomer versus millennial issue or a, an older versus younger workforce issue. This is new to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and you want to trade, train on what the inputs are in terms of go to your managers that are doing the hiring or the ones that are doing the evaluations of, of employees, train them on what, what we're putting into the system and get their input on what it is uh, and what it should be. Train on the outputs. We talked about taking the data and then doing something purposeful with it. Train on the risks, train on what we can do proper with the data that comes out and what you know maybe would, would cause an increase in, in risk. And also training in the educator background, it's not a one-time event. This happens continuously. It's sort of why Mark always wants us to do these webinars every so often. We want to continually train um, our partners in this world about what it is they need to be up to date on today. Well, with AI, that's going to be a constantly evolving system and a constantly mm -hmm. evolving issue. So make sure your training is at all levels for all purposes and is constantly evolving. Um, as this is going to continue to grow, it's going to continue to get more complicated, but it also has immense benefits to your company. So knowing what it is, how to use it, how to get employees comfortable with it is going to be huge for making it better for your business. Because those who are earlier to adopt and earlier to optimize use of things like AI tools are going to be the ones who benefit the most competitively and strategically in the market. Um, I think we're a little over, but I think that's the end. Is there more slides? Yep. Carrie, close us out. Yep. I think does any, I, there's one question in the chat. It's internal, but I'll throw it out there about whether we, what kind of things we should be seeking from vendors on reasonableness for indemnification. 
So the issue that the EEOC highlights on this is is who is liable for if there's an adverse impact, like you, you have 100 candidates, 50 are diverse, 50 are non-diverse, and when you do your selection criteria, you end up with a pool of 10 applicants, nine of whom are non-diverse, one of whom is diverse. Something happened along the way, potentially, right? Statistically, that doesn't sit well with the four-fifths rule, and you need to evaluate why that happened. It may be proper or may be an issue. The vendor's probably going to want you to indemnify them. That's all on you. It's your input, your data, whatever. It's just our tool. You should be evaluating, well, but what if they didn't follow your instructions? What if they didn't disclose to you, you know, something that they had done? So it goes into that issue of negligence. It goes into the issue of division of responsibilities. And it's reasonable to ask, you know, what they're doing how they're doing it. Have they tested it before? Have they gone into that level of analysis? And if they haven't, if they're willing to do so, and that goes back to vet your vendor, if they're not, tells you a little something about how, you know, where you should be of using that particular tool. Yeah. And I think it's important to note that the EEOC doesn't care um, what your indemnity provision looks like uh, as an employer you're you're going to be responsible so really from a sort of um a, a risk mitigation or at that point a, a cost mitigation perspective um taking a close look at those those provisions in your contract that michael just talked about is going to be important so you can sort of assess the risks before they become a problem um and so our, the contractual parties understand um who's going to be left holding the bag between the two of them because again the eeoc isn't going to care what the what the contract says Fair enough. Any other questions from anyone? I've been monitoring the chat. I think I've answered those that needed to be done. So I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank everybody for presenting. It was very informative for a person who didn't necessarily either know what AI was before <laughs> a few weeks ago. Michael, I thought it was quite good. I appreciate everybody's insight and uh, we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.